Hi, and welcome to the Rare Business Podcast. My name is Adrian Swinsko, and I'm a consultant, advisor, researcher, and writer on all things related to customer service and customer experience. Through this podcast, I seek out and interview CEOs, entrepreneurs, business and tech leaders, and leading thinkers about what it takes to build organizations that produce better outcomes for both customers and employees in this fast-moving modern age that we live in. If this is your first time listening to one of these interviews, then welcome. And please do dive into the archives at adrianswinsko.com, as I've now completed over 250 of these interviews in the last few years. If this is not your first time listening, then thank you for returning, and I'll aim to do a good enough job to keep you coming back week after week. Anyway, that's enough from me right now. Let's get into the interview. So welcome to the next edition of the Rare Business Podcast. With me today, I have Jason Stockwood, who is the CEO of Simply Business. Hi, Jason. How are you doing? Morning, Jason. Yeah, I'm great. Thank you. Thanks for having me on. You're very welcome. Now, Jason, um, we're going to talk about your book, the new book that you just written, which is very exciting um, in a minute. But before we get to that, can you give people or tell, give me a bit of a thumbnail sketch on you and the work that you do and Simply Business and things? So... Um, just sets sets the tone a little bit. Yeah, definitely. So um, I'll, I'll go back a bit further than most people because I think it's relevant when we talk about the book in a moment. Okay. But, um, so, so, my, so my background is um, I'm from the north of England originally, a place called Grimsby that most people in the UK hopefully will have heard of but probably never visited for, for reasons that would be obvious. <laughs> um, but it's, uh, I was a very working class, single parent upbringing. Yeah. And... Um, and, but the consequences of that is I had a great childhood with almost limitless boundaries and was able to just follow my passions through life. So fortunately, through the help of some great teachers, I had ended up um, getting a scholarship to go to a high school in America. I then went on a kibbutz in Israel. Uh, I then went back to work at Disney World in Florida and eventually landed doing a degree at a time in the UK when you could go to university for free. And again, it was without obviously a vocational aim, but was just really something I was interested in. And then fast forward to sort of 20, when I was 27, I got, I'd done some more traveling and I'd worked in, you know, in Greece for a while. I started working in the travel industry, a company in the UK called Trailfinds, which is a phenomenal business yeah. brand, um, but literally run like a military operation because the founder, Mike Gooley, was ex-SAS. Right. And, um, you know, so, so it was a business that I jumped into that many things that were culturally great about it. But, you know, the, some things about it were problematic to someone who's slightly more freewheeling uh, and maybe liberal in the way that they think. Yeah. So I had the great good fortune in the late 90s when the Internet was starting to, to rev up and starting to have real coming to public consciousness to get um, involved with lastminute.com, which was sort of the doyen of the, the first wave of the Internet. Yes. And I spent seven years there in commercial roles, starting off with some of the airline relationships. And then latterly, when we got bought by Travelocity, nearly 600 million, I ended up running uh, Travelocity Business, which is a corporate travel. Right. And, and then jumped ship um, to go and, and, and sort of accelerate the growth of Match.com, the dating business outside of Europe, which was great. But at a time when internet dating really wasn't pervasive, and you know, you're more likely to admit to being a, an axe murderer than, than being on online dating sites on mid-2000s. <laughs> and then yes. that was sold, and um, when I was looking for the next thing to do, I wanted a market where customers were underserved, technology hadn't played out, um, and Simply Business was an obvious place for that. And it wasn't the business it was today, but just knew that there was a huge market opportunity in which we could change both the lives of consumers, and more importantly, which is something we'll come on to, you know, really build a business that was doing something different from a cultural point of view. And then I just briefly, on the side of that, I've been involved with the Drink Aware Trust as a trustee. You know, I was on the board of Skyscanner, my travel business, and also I do a bunch of seed investing as well. So, so, so a varied career, but predominantly the last 20 years has been in e-commerce. Perfect. I mean, thank you for that. I mean, that's, um, you've kind of look, looks like you've kind of there's been on the, Different lily pads and like and quite major lily pads in that sort of whole uh, internet e-commerce, particularly in the UK sort of frame. So big brand names like you know Last Minute and and Match and you know and now onto Simple Business. But I know that I've spoken to your colleague before, a uh, colleague of yours before, uh, Fiona McSwain, in a previous interview on the on the podcast, and 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 that's where my 
interest in simple business and what you're doing uh, right now is sort of was initially ignited, as it were. And so then I was really excited that you actually kind of went and written a book about what you do and how you do it. And but also, I guess it's almost to try and tackle some of the both kind of explain what you're doing, but also try and tackle some of the, the, the issues that you see kind of coming up in, in our economy, our society kind of right now. So before we get stuck into that, I mean, the new book is called Reboot, A Blueprint for a Happy Human Business in a Digital Age. I mean, so can you tell, tell us a little bit about the book and who's it for and what's it trying to tackle, as it were, in its main thesis? Yeah, so there were, there were a couple of things that, that, that led me to want to write the book. So, and I, and I think of these as sort of connecting signals mm-hmm. that, uh, that, have, that have started to appear ever, ever louder on, on my my radar, so the the, the the couple of main areas. So one sort of macro level, I'm starting to get really agitated and irritated by the uh, the sort of dystopian sort of view that was being peddled off the back of um, the 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 report that came out of Oxford last year by the academics Frey and Osborne. They, they, I mean, a lot of people saw this where it sort of predicted that because of AI and and sort of progressive technologies up to 47% of jobs are going to go. Yeah. And, you know, that, that, that headline may or may not be true. I happen to think it's, it's not. But, you know, whether it is on that, there was no counter-argument being presented. It was kind of, kind of going, look, that, that jobs are going to go, and kind of, if, if you're not going to benefit from a capitalist point of view, then look at it. And so, so one of the things was trying to calibrate an argument that looked at my personal experience and the experience of academics that have been fortunate to me. It's mm-hmm. trying to a different narrative around that. I'll give you a quick short short story about my experience. So a few years ago, in 2013, mm-hmm. to a university in Palo Alto called Singularity University that is is right at the vanguard of, of you know new tech, high tech, sort of you know, founded by Ray Kurzweil, yes. uh, was the, the, the author of a book called The Singularity is Near. Literally, you know, he's the he's the evangelist who believes we're going to upload our consciousness into up into the matrix within the next 20, 20 years. And, and I've been taught humanity will be a footnote in evolutionary history. Mm-hmm. So I went to meet because I'm obviously I'm fascinated by technology and, and, and I believe about the positive impact of tech. And, and, and at the end of this week, Ray comes out to tell this presentation to a group of us. And, um, and as he sort of trots out to get going on and talk about his book, How to Create a Mind, um, he couldn't get PowerPoint to work. Yeah. And so I had to get an AV guy to come out and fiddle with the cables and get this to work. And whilst, you know, I've got a huge respect for the work and for, and for the, you know, the stuff they has done over the years, I thought it was a really interesting moment. I kind of looked around in the audience to think, look, look we're going to upload our brains into consciousness, and we're talking about that. And most of us can't, you know, those that have done presentations and have trouble with PowerPoint, recognise that moment. And the irony just seemed to be lost on people. So <laughs> hey, I'm, I'm just trying to connect the hubris and the and the sort of dystopian view about technology with some of my own personal experience. And the book's littered with examples, um, very real examples from people that are in the know yeah. um, about why that dystopian view is unlikely in the near term. And if it is in the long term, then there are things we can do. The second thing was, you know, I wanted to tell the Simply Business story. You know, we made, you know, a ton of progress off the back of a ton of mistakes and lessons over the years. Mm-hmm. And I, now that's that's you know the, the the model of a business that I wanted to build and wanted to work in, and so there is some guide ropes that if you believe that uh, you know technology is going to be have an ever or I mean, you know, a more prevalent place in society, then how can you how can you shape a business that 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 that, that takes the benefit of that to benefit both your customers and the people that you know work with you and and society at large, and so you know simply business while they're still a work in progress. You know, I think we, we've started off on a journey which thinks of stakeholders rather than just shareholders as important constituents of our success. Yeah. And then the final reason, just briefly, is, you know, I've got, I've got two kids, nine and six. Yes. You know, for me, over the last five or six years, while I've been thinking deeply and writing and talking about this stuff, it's really a sense of how to be a better parent or a godparent or uncle or aunt or whatever. Our relationships to the, to, to the world our children are going to inhabit, which is clearly going to be more technologically advanced. How we can get 
you know, the benefits of technology in their hands, but make sure they're forming the right habits and, you know, and they're not sat 10 hours playing Fortnite, wetting themselves, which was in the news a couple of weeks ago. So it's how that balances a parent. So I'm just trying to think through, you know, the relationship of technology and humanity and our habits as well, because yeah. that's not going to work. But it is important for us to be conscious and deliberate about thinking around that interplay. So quite quite meaty sort of philosophical topics and then tangibly brought down to people who are in businesses or starting businesses or thinking about you know, how businesses can be reorientated. And then um, mostly I would say it's really about me thinking about the role of technology and the habits we form as we go into you know, the next 10 or 20 years. But do you think, I mean, thank you for that, Jason, is that a, but do you think, it seems to me, I was thinking about, I was listening to you, what you were saying and thinking about it and just thinking on the impact of technology and what Ray Kurzweil is saying and, and the story about the PowerPoint not working and having to get the AV guy out. And I was just thinking about the idea that if we're all uploading our consciousness into the, um, um, into the matrix, as it were, is that, does that mean that we're also going to have to leave behind an AV team to make sure that we kind of like solve any of the glitches? Uh, and I don't, I don't know. And it seems that, that that's a slightly kind of, if you like, a cynical aside. But I just, but I was also thinking about the ideas like, but surely it's about choice and about being de- making deliberate choices about what we want and what we don't want. And so the idea is like, you know, if that's coming, we, that's not going to happen by accident. We're going to have to either, I guess, well, it might happen by accident because we might choose not to have that, uh, not to do anything about that. And it just happens. But then surely that, that becomes the challenge is like to make, to decide what we want and then to then plot a path to it, don't you think? I think that's spot on. I think that's, again, that's some of, the, um, some of the things that have been lost in the debate recently. You know, the, the technology in and of itself is not a problem, right? Because, you know, technology has always been around and, you know, throughout history, it's enabled us to enhance the human condition. Yeah. So I think... I think you know, there's, a, there's a, little, a little bit of humility that we need to add into this and a little bit of agency as well, which is, you know, as I've said, the problem is not the technology, our relationship to it, but how you know, the, the types of technology that we want to choose to build yeah. and the habits we want to form around those technologies that can enhance you know, our capabilities of people. Whereas, yes. you know, that's, so the, the report came out, it was like 47% of jobs are going to go, good luck with that. And I just think that there are... And I think this is a natural consequence. I don't think that's malicious, that, that, that end point of that debate, by the way. I think it's a, it stimulated the debate, and this is the next stage of it, which is okay. Whether that's true or not, who knows, quite frankly. Sure. And you can take a view on that. You know, certainly in the near term, in the next 20 years, you know, I can't see that happening. So, but, you know, we've got 20 years' worth of life to live, mm. and some decisions that we can make that will orientate to a future that, you know, again, can be incredibly positive. Humanity. Peter Diamandis is the other founder of um, Singularity University. Wrote a wonderful book, I think six, seven years ago, called Abundance, uh-huh. which again sets out this optimistic view of, of how high tech can totally enhance our humanity. Mm. So I think I think you know part of this is you know we've got near term choices about how we how we you know how we engage with technology, how we take the benefits of technology from wealth creation, how we enhance our humanity, our, and, and the book really for me is about positing some of those arguments around the role of business and work in that because it's a huge part of our lives and while you know, politics is struggling to keep up with the, past of te- the, sort of the pace of technological change, I think you know, business has a role to play in setting up places that can create a, a, a better view of humanity, which is why I call it a reboot, right. rather than a, at least I think it's an upgrade on the sort of model of capitalism the benefits of technologies and, and to quite frankly share them more broadly and more purposefully around you know creating you know um you know the, what aristotle would call you know good the good life yeah but it's a, it, but the idea that the central to this is about making kind of choices like choices about technology but you also get in the book that you state that the the current model of business i mean predominantly this the dominant logic being the pursuit of shareholder value above all, all else and you say that's it's broken and that we need to grapple with some, in order to fix it, we need to grapple with some challenges and questions. I mean, that's all about making a choice around, I feel like, I guess, the agency of business and, so, and deciding that it's, it doesn't have to just be about shareholder value. It can be about other things. And I guess that's what you're trying to do with and trying to describe 
in Reboot and what you've tried to, and what you're trying to do with Simply Business. Would that be accurate? Yeah. So again, you know, most most people are you know the probably people that listen to your podcast will be aware of you know we're, we're playing out. You know, an economic model that started in the 50s with Friedman and Hayek. Yeah. It was most boldly and politically and dangerously encapsulated through Reaganism and Thatcher. Mm -hmm. And it's this sort of neoliberal sort of wet dream that we, they, they envisaged and we've been living, you know, culminated in 2008 and the shock waves. And the repercussions that we're feeling of that. So, you know, for a while. Can I just say, we're not finished with that kind of as yet because I don't think we've actually learned the lessons of it. Well, I think that's part, part of the point, Rage, is that, you know, we've got to a point where, you know, it's, it's you know, the, the, the sort of 10-year anniversary of Lehman Brothers, which I think is you know, literally any day now. Yeah. You know, is, is, you know, have we, I think, I think there's an ONS study that said that, you know, we, we, the, the, the bonus pool, UK PNC, was PLC, was the largest it's been since 20, um, 20, um, um, 07, I think. Yeah. Again, there's some, there's some signals again, and, and and look for for me, I think it's simple that you know capitalism has you know raised all boats over the last. If you look over the long view of the last sort of 150 years, and you know we're working fewer hours, you know healthcare outcomes are better. You know, by every measure, you know, ca you know capitalism has done a, a, a reasonable job there, and any alternatives have been suggested, but it's still chaotic, and and the role of technology. Is going to further exacerbate some of the problems with capitalism. Yes. And so, so for me, in simple terms, I think that you know the true value of a business has to be seen when it's placed in the wider social context. It can't just be about shareholders and shareholders alone. They are absolutely critical, by the way. I'm not mm -hmm. saying in any shape or form, you know, the shareholder model needs to be done away with. But I think there are equal, equally important constituents alongside them: employees. The society at large, you know, the environment as well. Mm. I think this is this is the model that I'm positing, and you know, and I think I think you know, again, if I think about some of the signals we're seeing, whether it's you know the concentration of wealth, there's a there's a again something I quote in the book, the House of Commons Library it says yeah. that one you know, percent of global wealth is now in you know, it, well, it's, it's predicted to be in sixty four percent. Well, sorry, the 1% of the population will own 64% of the wealth by 2030 yeah. if we carry on on the same path. And, and that's, you know, that's just going to create huge social upheaval that we're seeing already. And, you know, and, you know, and we haven't, the austerity measures off the back of you know, the, the repercussions of 2008 haven't played out fully yet. You know, we're seeing it in Brexit and we're seeing it in Trump. And so I just, I just, I just think that, you know, there, 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 are, there are so many benefits that we've gleaned over the last 150 years that we just need to recalibrate, particularly when you look at the pressure that accelerated technologies are going to play yes. in that particular debate, and say, look, how, how do we think about that being distributed? And, and again, simply because business is not perfect, but we've, we've created some argument and, and some models to try, to try and think about that. And so can you briefly, briefly sort of describe kind of, um, I mean, so there's some big challenges in there, including, you know, and I would add some of the stuff that's playing out in terms of the, you know, local authorities, particularly in the UK, going bust or on the verge of going bust or have to have to cut services, local services in order to kind of balance the balance the books because of the cut in funding from central government. And it, you know, feels like there's a lack of co courageous conversations going on around what do we want and what do we want to be and how do we want to run things? And it's almost a bit like the same old, same old, carry on. And, and it, the, the models, we, the model proved to be to have broken, but we still haven't fixed it. We just put like a sticky plaster on it and then hoped nobody had noticed and then just thought, oh, we'll just kind of, we'll just keep going because everything, we got into this short-term cycle of just fix rather than actually design what we want. And it comes back to that point of choices, I guess. And the, but that requires work and effort and and and... And the degree of conflict and big decisions and hard decisions as well. But anyway, I'll stop talking now because I'll, I'll, I'll start ranting in a minute. Well, about we'll, it. we'll end up talking about politics, which is probably all of the half an hour, really, Adrian. But for, for me, it's just, you know, we, 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 we've just, if we look at our generation and, you know, we're similar ages, I think, I think we, you know, get the same sort of scorecard as I got on my school report, which is could do better. Yes. There were a number of years where, you know, things were looking optimistic and, you know, global poverty was decreasing. And I think since 2008, we've gone backwards. I mean, there's a, there's a horrific stat, by the way, 
that, that um, you know, we look at life expectancy, which over the last 200 years has doubled, you know, from 40, UK in particular, to it's all low 80s. And, and it's been going up again since the 50s. Yeah. And last year, it went backwards a year for the first time because of poverty and because of the impact of austerity. Mm. I think, you know, we're, we're just, we're failing the next generation coming through. Yeah. You know, there's another horrific statistic around, and this was a Stanford and Harvard study that says, if you're 30 year old today, you're only 50% likely to be better off than your parents. Whereas in most generations from the 40s onwards, it was sort of between 80 and 90% more likely to be better than your parents. So yes. It's just, again, the signals are, are loud and clear. They're so flashing so, so brightly on the dashboard of, of, of you know, of, 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 of the whole society. And I think, you know, again, we just need... I think business can do a better job. I think politics is, is going backwards to... The old models that failed already, and I think that's causing rising, you know, issues in nationalism, and, and you know, they're, they're just not delivering the prosperity and progress that political systems can. Yes, which is why I think business can have a bigger role to play because done properly, you know, we we have, we, we just don't. It's not just the livelihoods of people that we take care of, but their lives, in the broadest sense. And I think that's where the opportunity to have a, a you know more positive impact rather than you know, sort of four year cycles of trying to get voted in. Yeah. Uh, and, Make the right things, particularly under the scrutiny sort of social media, which doesn't allow people to speak to their values these days. So. Yeah, but I think this, what's interesting is it also is that kind of politics is, and social developments is almost analog. It can be an analogous and possibly, possibly foretell a little bit of some of the issues or predict some of the issues that businesses might face, and that is almost like politics and social dynamics and government and all that sort of stuff is almost a bit like Taylorism gone mad. It's like managed by the numbers, and but you end up getting into that map and territory sort of thing. Well, the numbers are saying kind of this, but they actually don't describe kind of what's going on on the ground and the real kind of feeling. And, and I think maybe that's kind of that. Those are problems that that businesses are are facing as well. And you know, we just need to look at some of the global and also local sort of engagement figures around for employees to see that production line economics and tailorism and, and scientific management had took us so far but actually if we want more we need to kind of we need to don't don't assume that if we just do do more that do more of this stuff that we're going to get higher results because actually I think we've got to the end and we need to we've got to almost a decision node and say that model's run its course and now we need to kind of take we need to do something different if we want to take things on that's a big that's a big theme through the book right so Frederick Taylor is, is one of the early characters and protagonists in the book, which yeah. is, I think, think was hugely positive impact on scientific management and, and uh, you know, the turn of the sort of 19th, 20th century. You know, huge impact, I think, in terms of creating the models of business that did well for a number. But I just don't think it's a, a relevant model for the 21st century. I think we've, we haven't made the transition. And so both our education systems and the way we're organising society and what we believe good to look like in a, in a world that used to be analog and, you know, in binary in terms of decision processes, just just has moved on so rapidly in the last 20 and 30 years. Yeah. We need a new model of leadership and polit both politically and for the business, actually, that recognises inherent complexity and the nature of, you know, integrated systems and the connectedness between everything that we do at every point. Yes. And it's just possible to model, to model that in the way that, you know, Taylor uh, and sort of the MBAs that were taught through Harvard, et cetera, through the 80s, and create a coherent view anymore. So, and I'm not saying do away with that, by the way. I'm saying, you know, we need to take the best of planning and systemized thinking, but map that to, you know, understanding that, you know, emergent systems and leadership that requires, you know, a, a less control, quite frankly, and yes. less belief in, in, you know, in being, uh, in being right and more trying to, be adaptive to you know, whatever whatever the the inputs tell us. So, and again, I'm not saying throw out the baby with the bathwater there. You know, there, there is a there's a place for efficiency and modelling operational excellence. But at the same time, recognising that, and you know, we just know more about psychology. We know more about the complexity of the world, and that and that that plays out in 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 recognising that we just can't go through the grades of managed management. Yes to decisions anymore. So I think that's true for almost every part of life. And it requires you know, recognition of humility, recognition of an understanding of psychology that we're not rational. You know, all the inputs on behavioural science 
in the last few years tells us clearly that we're we're not the rational creatures that you know you know that, that economics predicted over the last hundred years, and we have biases and we have subconscious influences on our behaviors mm-hmm. and we should give in to some of some of that and say let's let go of the belief in that predictability in some situations and recognize that we need a risk tolerant view that allows us to be adaptive and respond in a way that quite frankly I think is more human but is also a more interesting way of, of thinking a way that businesses can be run yeah no I think I think you're absolutely right and so I tell you what why don't um that I think you I mean, we've potentially sort of posed or framed the challenge sufficiently well for now so tell me kind of how how are you responding to that in simply business I mean so if you've moved to if, if you think kind of tailorism doesn't quite fit and scientific management had taken us only so far then what what have you done to try and respond to that emergent systems and complex kind of problem understanding and things and get the most out of people so so there's, there's a section in the book that I, that I talk about and again all of this was an experiment you know it's been an experiment through my career but you know, most most um, um, clearly articulated at Simply Business. But there's sort of four four areas that I, that I believe are um, are inherent on at least a an attempt to calibrate you know your business around you know, the the sort of complexity of, of a world that we now inhabit. So the, the first one is about I call it giving away responsibility. Right. And, and again, this is this is you know it takes there's, there's, there's some some scrutiny to these statements that probably hopefully will. We'll push people to the book, but essentially for me, you know, with the, with the pace and the complexity of the world that we inhabit, um, then we need to make decisions in organisations as close to the customers and the problems as possible, which means that, you know, the leader's role has changed. Rather than being the highest paid opinion making the decision, the role you know, is, is to set the clear strategy and direction for the business, um, create the, the culture that you want, and then allow decisions to be made in a risk, you know, risk tolerant way. So never, you know, you're never bet in the house on this. But people who are close to the customer, creating experiments and hypotheses and measures that try and improve our customers' lives. Yeah. And then the derivative of that, you know, as I mentioned there, you know, creating the culture. So number one job I think of leaders in organisations is building trust. Right. And, you know, creating an environment where. You know, people can express themselves, be themselves, and do their best work, um, and and without recrimination, but without without in an environment that is, you know, one of the primary outputs of that is the ability to learn um, and move the organisation on. Mm. And then the other couple of things, the last couple of things, are really, you know, hold on to I call it holding on to your burdens as a leader as well. So while I talk a lot about giving away responsibility, you know, building trust. There are things that you and only you can do. So just making sure that you don't, you're not a lightning rod for all of your stress and all of the decisions that need to be made. And the example I give in the book is, um, you know, in the first um, year of me being in Simply, we got down to our last twenty thousand pounds, and you know we had one hundred and fifty people at that point. And we had, we started to have conversations around, you know, did we pay people that month or not? And right. So that that sort of thing is not a conversation that you are open and transparent about. <coughs> so there's balance there. As well, and then yeah. the final thing I talk about is for, for, for leadership and for senior people in organ, you've got to understand how you are seen and make sure that the values of the organisation and, and your ability to be authentic is 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 exactly that. Which is, you know, you, you know, if you talk about you know, giving away responsibility, make sure you're not involved in every decision. If you talk about you know, making sure you're, you know, you're empowering people. Make sure that, again, you're not in every meeting or trying to, trying to, trying to, trying to override people's decisions. And then find also just within that, just about your role modelling, your behaviours as well. I just think there are things that leaders can do that can totally undermine all of their good work. I had an old boss years ago, and, and obviously the reasons that apparently have to remain nameless, but he was a brilliant, brilliant man, and just intellectually and, you know, from an energy point of view, but. He was always in the pub on a Friday night, muddled up to, to the girls from HR. And for me, it was always took away from from the values. No matter what he did as a business leader, yeah, the fact that he liked to drink a bit too much and, and was 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 a, a womanizer. It just bothers me. So, so I think there's something about making sure that you, know, you think about as a leader, you're observed and your behaviour is on show at all times. Yeah. So making sure that you hold yourself to a high account 
and, and you know, and it doesn't mean living like a monk, but for me, it's making sure that you don't give people the opportunity to, for some spurious reason, take away from from all the effort and good work you do elsewhere. So again, I go into a lot more detail, but those those are sort of the highlights of what I think leadership. Uh, the leadership challenge for the twenty first century. Perfect. I mean, uh, there was one thing right at the very beginning you talked about. It was this idea of like risk tolerance, and it's I personally. I mean, I think that apart from the leadership challenge, which is uh, again a, a major thing, I think there's there's this risk tolerance idea that I think in many organisations we are oriented around when something goes wrong where we end up getting forensic in terms of trying to understand the, the root of the problem and why things kind of failed and so on and so forth, and how, how we can minimize those kind of that happening ever again. And my feeling is, is that what we end up doing is we end up oriented, orienting ourselves towards not losing rather than winning because actually we don't recognize when things go right. So it reminds me of a story a friend of mine told me about Brian Clough, who you'll know, um, and I, I don't know what you think about Brian Clough, but you know, in his, in his time, he was a very successful football manager. And it, there was a story where apparently when his team was playing away from home and they'd say they'd lost and they, they got back on the coach and they were driving back to, uh, his other, I think it was Nottingham at the time, and he would routinely stop at a country pub along the way and, and he would stop the pub and he would go and stop at the, the bus and he would say to the, the guys on the bus, he would say, right, you lot, off the bus, in the pub, have a couple of pints, get out of your system, you know what you've done, then get back on the bus and let's focus on winning, kind of what we need to do to win the next kind of game. And it was almost that treating everybody as, as, as an adult rather than like as a school child created a very mature relationship uh, with the players and so they took the responsibility and the learning from them on themselves uh, and so they didn't feel like they were being lectured all the time if you know what I mean and so it feels like that we need to it's almost like I'm not saying we shouldn't focus on learning from our mistakes and we shouldn't understand that and try and minimize that but we need to almost like add, unlearn a little bit of that and then add, learn at some new stuff in terms of focus on that allows us to focus on winning as well I think you spot oh, by the way there's a whole other podcast of Brian Clough and there's a brilliant book I don't know if you read it called The Damned United, which was yeah. written in the first person by David Peace, and it's a brilliant, you, know, you can hear his voice. Yeah. But, um, yeah, look, I just, I just think there's, I think, again, we've just, we just swerved too far in the opposite direction through, uh, for, for, because of Frederick Taylor, you know, in terms of thinking of you know, humanity as this systemised and which is thing to be optimised. And, and I just, it just doesn't speak to the heart. And for me, you know, it's about recognising you know, the people's passions and values and frail and identifying their frailties and vulnerabilities. None of us know. Yes. The punch, you know, so, so, so why do we suddenly demand certainty for an environment where you know you build a plan and you execute on it? And if, if you know, if, if that thing that you said a year ago isn't true, suddenly you know suddenly undermines everything you've done. So, so you know, I think there are there are lots of methodologies that. You know, throughout the years, that have done a better job at that. More recently, you know, agile for software development, mm -hmm. sort of the lean, uh, lean methodologies that most prominently, eloquently, you know, described by Eric Reed means that you know you just create an environment. You've got high trust, and the risk tolerance is you know a couple of weeks worth of work maximum. Then you know people will try and they'll try and do their best work and they'll try and experiment their way yeah. to better. Reality. And this is not just for customers, by the way. You know, we've hired a behavioural scientist in our organisation. Did a bunch of experiments on organisational design as well. Yeah. So, so I just think, think of that experimental culture. And by the way, it doesn't mean that you can be wrong all the time. It's a different thing. But for us, a simple business, we hire brilliant people. So you've got to be good to, to work here technically. Mm -hmm. But then we look for this that, that added extra. So we have a, an interview question that you know my colleague you know, Lucas. Oberhuber came up with, which was at the end of interviews, we say, are we excited at the thought of working with this person? Because so, you can get technical ability, but the idea that someone will come in and add something to our culture, yeah. and, and you know, again, the culture's emerging and adaptive as well. Mm -hmm. but I think it's just recognising that we don't know and we will get it wrong more often than we get things right. Yeah. But within that, 
you know, a supportive and risk tolerant culture. That, so when you're placing a bet, you're only betting twenty pounds rather than betting you know, your house on it. Yes. Sure that they, they, you know, because no one should bear that responsibility. Yeah. Apart from the CEO of an organisation. So again, I just think I just think it recognises our humanity in a deeper way. Mm. Ultimately, creates an environment where people aren't prepared to try new stuff. I tell an, an analogy. I, I, I don't think I put this in the book, actually, but this is a true story that. Years ago, when my kids were little and I used to walk them up to school, there used to be a small wall, like a, like a, a one-foot, maybe two-foot wall. And my kids used to jump on it, as kids do every morning, and walk up and try and balance. And occasionally, you know, they'd step in something they shouldn't or they'd, or they'd scratch their shoes. But it was just a bit of fun, and they used to say to them, look, concentrate, just get to the end. And then one day I was walking up with a friend of ours, and their kid jumped up, and the parent went, get down, you'll fall. Yeah. And I thought it was just really interesting. It struck me out just the mindset within the two sets of children. Again, by the way, I don't, we don't get it right all the time with parenting, obviously, but I was thinking about just the two two messages you give to those kids. One, which is, yeah, you'll scratch yourself, just concentrate, you might fall, the lesson they might learn from that. Whereas the kid that hears, get down, you'll fall straight away. Yeah. And, I, and I've used that analogy in the business, which is, I want people in, in our work to jump up on the two-foot wall and occasionally fall off and scratch their knees or step in something they shouldn't. Just have fun with that. Mm. Now, what I don't want to do is be stepping up on a 20-foot wall and the risk associated with that. And whilst I'm, you know, I'm, I'm, it's, not, it's starting to sound slightly patriarchal in, in my view, but I think that risk, that risk just making sure you're, you're setting the environment where people can have fun and, and learn for themselves. Because I think the business benefits from that. Because if you bet the house or someone falls off the 10-foot the, the wall, you're going to spend a year cleaning up that, that mess rather than you know, working on the next experiment. So I, I thought that was a, a useful analogy for me personally as I thought about the mindset I wanted to still both in the business and, quite frankly, my children as well. I think, what, I think also, I mean, I, thank you for that. I think it's, it, it's a great analogy, but I think what it also makes me think is if you take this sort of approach, which is if you like, uh, also more open to um, potentially, I guess what I'm saying is that it's not as scientific in its approach, but adds a little bit of art and into it as well. And also is a bit more open to other approaches and to learning and different, you know, different styles of people. Then it means that um, you, it leaves you also kind of open to recruiting and attracting different types of people which is going to possibly inject the ideas and the creativity and the innovation that you're going to need to propel future growth if that makes sense oh i, I mean completely right and again it's just it's just staggering to me that people are just sort of waking up to it. the idea of a, a diversity forget about its moral imperative which is absolutely critical yes. just in terms of the health of your business right you want as diverse a range of views and that comes across the spectrum of ethnicity, sexuality, nationality, you know, gender, you know, just every type of, you know, every type of variable that you could put into that mix, you want as diverse a set of opinions in your business because you get better answers. Sure. Not only do you get a better workplace, better debate, more fun, you get you get better answers. So it's just again, this is there's been progress in the last thirty or forty years, but there's still work to do in that. But it just seems obvious to me. Mm. And again, Simply Business is by no means the finished articles on any of these, you know, on any of these vectors. But at the same time, it, it, it just it just it just makes business sense as much as it makes moral sense to me. So yeah. that's kind of the message of the business as well. Uh, sorry, the book as well. Perfect. So Jason, I'm conscious of time, but I'm just going to want to say is that if I was to say to you, I mean, we we've talked probably kind of weaved our way in and out of the book, but not necessarily specifically referenced the the book. But there's everything we talked about. I think is is in the books. So I've been through it, and it's I think it's 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 great, and it's very timely, as well. And it's both like a manifesto for a different way, but it's also a case study of what you guys are doing as well. As you say, it's a continuous, ongoing experiment. But if I was to ask you to, if you like, give a piece of advice or pose a question to any of the executives and entrepreneurs, professionals that are listening into this interview about about what you think is currently going on. What would it What would it be? So, so you know, for, for me, it's about embracing technology. I've worked in tech businesses for the last twenty years, so let's not be let's not be afraid of embracing technologies. And and quite frankly, let's 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 do away with a bunch of jobs and tasks 
Oh, either all dirty or dangerous has ever been um, um, been quoted as saying. Um, so, so for me, it's about look, let's make sure that technology is advancing all of humanity rather than just um, you know just lining the pockets of you know, a handful of white you know Western guys. And I, and I think that that's basically it for me, which is you know let's embrace the technology, but let's think of the role in enhancing humanity rather than it being something that just serves um, you know shareholders. Let's think of the ways in which we can be more deliberate about our relationship with technology, the habits that, that, that technology is forming for us, sure. and how this, this period, the, you know, the next 20 years, can be a way that serves you know, humanity's higher purpose and moves us on again, which I, I genuinely believe it can. Yes. So for me, it's thinking, when you think about implementing these whole technologies, you know, what we're trying to do is simply business, and one of the strong arguments of the book is saying, let's, let's implement high-tech solutions, but let's use that to benefit shareholders, but let's, one of the experiments we're trying to run is can we get everyone in our contact centre to a four-day week. Yes. By it's really about, it's about saying, let's, let's, let's embrace technology, utilise it, but think about the distributed benefits and make sure it's human, humanity and aggregate level rather than, you know, sh- you know, just, you know, returns on capital being the primary motivation. Perfect. I mean, it seems, it seems there's a central idea in all of this is that if we, decide, if we don't decide what we want, then we're going to get what we get given. And that's almost like a, we almost you um we have to become more proactive and more active and you know the decisions that we're that we're we're taking and the progress that we want to you know we want to achieve because if not then we end up we just we end up being passive recipients of just the um the market wave as it were we become followers rather than leaders um but thank you for that jason so this brings me to the, my final question I always ask at the end of these interviews, and it is this. Is there anything that you would like to shamelessly plug? No, not really. I mean, to the book. I mean, it's, 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 <laughs> it's, you know, I'm really proud of the work. It's, it's, you know, it's representative of the, you know, the last eight years and the great work of everyone at Simply Business. And yeah. so, you know, I hope it makes them proud. And, 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 I, and I want to start a discussion and a debate about some of these topics. Yeah as we think about the implications for technology. So, you know, people can, can, can engage with the book, you know, reboot, it's available on Amazon, and then, and then let's start a discussion around these topics at a societal level, try and make sure that we all take the benefits of technology. So, so reboot is, is the place for people to go, hopefully. Perfect. Jason, um, I think it's an important conversation. Uh, I am, you know, well, well, first of all, thank you for coming on the podcast. Congratulations on writing the, uh, writing the book. I think it's an important uh, conversation, but also congratulations on the work that you did at, um, at Simply Business. And in terms of helping progress and advance that conversation, count on me to, well, you can count me in. I'd be happy to help in any way I can on that because I, I completely believe it's a conversation that, that needs to happen. Really, thanks. I mean, thanks, Age. Thanks for your interest and your support on this. And if any of the listeners want to drop me a note, I'm on Twitter, at Jay Stockwood, or I'm on LinkedIn. So, so I'm, I'm around and about, so I generally want to have a discussion on this stuff. But appreciate your time today and uh, look forward to the ongoing debate. Fantastic. Thank you, Jason. And, uh, yeah, um, I'll speak to you again soon. Cheers. Yeah. Well, that's it for another interview. I really hope you enjoyed it. Now, every time I complete one of these interviews, I learn something new. And I try and incorporate that new learning into my writing, my speaking, my workshops, and the consulting that I do for my clients. If you're interested, you can find out more about how I work with clients over at adrianswimsco.com. But one final thing before I go, please consider heading over to iTunes or whichever podcast platform you choose to use and do leave a review. Every little helps, as they say. Anyway, that's all for now. Thank you for listening and do listen in again. All the very best.